Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're zooming in from. Welcome to a, a well-awaited, uh, anticipated conversation with three dynamic, intelligent uh, business women who know all about Japan, are embedded in Japan, are involved with Japanese business every day. And they're going to give us an update on what's happening in the country of Japan so that you can be more advised on how to invest, when to be involved, etc. There's a lot going on, as we all know, in Japan with the Olympics. And as we know, also around the world, there has been uh, a pandemic that has uh, particularly stricken uh, the country of Japan as well. And so that's influenced business opportunities along the way. And so let's listen to the experts today and hear what they have to say. There are three ladies that we're going to be speaking with today. And I'm going to kick off with, uh, with Catherine, but I would like to do a very brief introduction of each one. Uh, Catherine O'Connell is the founder and principal at Catherine O'Connell Law. And I think she corrected me the last time, and so I probably will say it wrong again, but she was the first lady to set up a law firm uh, in Tokyo. And I think the thing I, I said wrong before was that there was someone somewhere in Japan, uh, a foreigner, uh, a, uh, who had set up a law firm outside of Tokyo, but she is the first foreign woman to set up a law firm in Tokyo. And Catherine, please correct me if I'm wrong. Well, the one really cool thing or many cool things about Catherine is that she works with small companies. She works with big companies. She's been in the country for decades. Uh, she's originally from New Zealand. Um, she has a podcast that you must listen to. It's amazing. You know, she talks to uh, other women attorneys in Japan. And when I first looked at that, I thought, well, gee, you know, could that even be interesting? Oh, my God, it's amazing. You really do need to listen to it. I've learned so much about not just the law, but Japan and this particular women that uh, she interviews. So Catherine's going to kick off in a moment. But the two other people that we have today are, if you're part of Global Chamber, you know Debbie Howard uh, already. She's the chairman at the Carter Group of uh, Japan Market Research Network. She has been in Japan for I think it's 31 years, or at least that's in, in my head. And that's a long time. She, she is also not originally from Japan, but she basically is, she, she can show the card that says she's legit. And she has had so much success over the years. And one of the things we really appreciate about the, appreciate about the Carter Group is their strong capability to do market research for companies entering the market. And so if, if you're looking to do that, uh, definitely Debbie is the person to speak with. She'll be Zooming in today from uh, Texas and, and Catherine will be Zooming in from uh, Japan. The final third speaker we have today is Kathy Matsui. Uh, she's a general partner at Empowers Partners uh, she is a former vice chair of Goldman Sachs Japan and chief Japan equity strategist, an extraordinary woman. Uh, her groundbreaking womanomics research spurred the Japanese government to promote gender diversity. And I think, you know, when, when we say they're promoting gender diversity, I would say that my own experience is it's probably not as effective as it will be in five or 10 years from now. But the fact that what she was able to demonstrate spurred them to more movement forward is a, a just tremendous step forward. So thank you, Kathy, for your efforts there and a strong um, uh, uh, not, not just efforts, but results to get the Japanese government moving forward. So thank you ladies for joining us today. I really appreciate it. We all will appreciate it, I'm sure. So let's start with Catherine in the beginning. Uh, please give us Catherine a brief overview of the current situation in Japan, a lot going on. Uh, the number of uh, people vaccinated was so surprisingly low a month or two ago. It has been coming up. And now with the Olympics coming up, there's all sorts of things happening. Would love to hear from you. And I'm looking forward to it very much to hear your take of what's going on so we can begin this conversation. Thank you. 
Well, thank you so much, Doug. What a warm welcome that was. And really a big hello to you and to the Global Chamber members and guests who are on today. I really wish you were here in Tokyo, Doug, oh. uh, where, you know, I really do. We could have looked after you, but that will come in time. So Debbie will be giving um, a timeline of the COVID-19 and also statistics around sentiment and vaccinations and the Olympics. So let me just give a really quick snapshot of the very latest COVID-19 statistics, which I took from Reuters this morning. Um, we are in the morning, of course, in Tokyo here. So infections are at around 1,900 uh, new infections a day, 11 uh, infections per 100,000 people. Um, since the pandemic began, there's been about 820,000 infections total in Japan and just under 15,000 deaths from COVID-19. Actually, corona, non-corona uh, related deaths have actually been higher. For example, road deaths in 2020 were much higher than um, COVID-19 related deaths people stopped going on the train and took their own car to the roads. And that's why we had an increase in car accidents. We're now in the fifth wave and uh, the fourth state of emergency was declared uh, and started yesterday, our uh, Monday the 12th in Tokyo. It's a really long one this time. It's lasting for uh, six weeks until August 22nd. Through the Olympics, uh, I think it just before the Paralympics and through the summer holidays in Japan, the Obon period, when people normally travel throughout the country and overseas. So due to post-war constitutional issues, Japan just can't lock down like other countries. So this kind of softer, shall we say, state of emergency is what Japan puts in place. As to the vaccine rollout, yes, Doug, you indicated that it really was very glacial. It started only um, in, on February 14th this year. And truly, it was very, very slow, but it has ramped up in the last five to six weeks, thankfully. Japan has administered 60 million doses. So assuming that each person needs two doses, that's just on 24% of the population. And I know when we were texting earlier, Doug, uh, a few months ago, it was only around 1.2%. So it has increased. The average is 1.1 million doses a day. Olympics. Of course, the opening ceremony is due to kick off on the 23rd of July, only 10 days to go. Vaccine Minister Taro Kono pledged enough vaccines for 125 million people by the end of June, but that just hasn't happened, unfortunately. The torch relay for Tokyo is off the streets. We have no spectators in the stadium, just the Olympic family, which is the IOC representatives and some of the uh, country's dignitaries inside of the stadium. Athletes are arriving now with gust into the uh, Narita airport every single day. Some are returning positive PCR tests. There's a little bit of controversy around where they should be tested at Narita or host towns, but will the games be a beacon of light for humanity as Japan really, really wants it to be? We certainly hope so. And I have great faith in Japan that they will come through on a really amazing Olympics in the middle of a pandemic. Let's remember that. But That's only time will tell. I Only think time I will tell. Something about uh, an Israeli athlete was flagged with COVID. Could that be possible? I hadn't heard that one, but I've certainly heard of a few other countries that have, have had that. But you could have the latest, um, Doug. So that could be true. There's only the a couple of years you, ago. Amazing. Yeah, with, you know, with Israel, they are way ahead of the game with their vaccinations and, you know, not wearing masks and things now. But, you know, you can still be a carrier, can't you, even though you've been vaccinated and you can still get COVID-19, even if you've been vaccinated, your symptoms are just less. So that's entirely possible. I'd love to turn over to, uh, to Debbie now, Doug, if that's OK, for a few of the key results that she's got from this amazing uh, survey that her company, Carter, JMRN have done. And I think that will really set the scene on more of the details that I've just highlighted as well. Debbie, over to you. Perfect. Thank you, Catherine. And um, yeah, uh, well, you've got even later information than I do, actually, because this tracking survey was taken in mid-March. So um, what we've got here, though, are some very interesting numbers from mid-March in, in a series of five annual trackers. So every year in mid-March, Carter Group, Carter JMRN does this survey. And, uh, and the last two waves 
last year in 2020 and this year in 2021 were taken right in the middle of, of COVID, right at the beginning and, and of course now after a year in. So I'd just like to share a few points with you all just to set the context. Um, obviously we have negative impacts that people have uh, experienced physical health, mental health and social well-being. Um, we have uncertainty about the future, a little bit of a pessimistic outlook, but a little better than last year this time. Um, and um, a lack of confidence in the Japanese government and the way they've handled it and a divided opinion on whether the Olympics should be held or not. Obviously they're going to be held, but uh, the public opinion is pretty divided on that. And we've got some cautious spending behavior as a result of the prolonged pandemic. So I'm just going to walk you through a few details on that. Don't get nervous about the chart. <laughs> it's huge um, and got a lot of detail on it, but I'm going to walk you through it. And also there's a free downloadable PDF uh, that you can get from Global Chamber uh, in the post uh, promotion of this event. So when we look at the uh, overall timeline for COVID, what we're going to focus on first is the first state of emergency, which was, as you can see, last year, pretty much by May. So we all know about that, it's history, but the Olympics were postponed one time uh, last March, in late March, and of course we're moving ahead with them now. As we see what happens going forward, and of course history is great, you can look backwards and see it, but we can see the second wave and the second state of emergency. We can see the third and the fourth waves and the third state of emergency. And I think now, Catherine, you said we'd started the fifth wave and the fifth, I think the fifth state of emergency has already occurred, right? Just today, we start that. Yeah, so it's the fourth state of emergency and uh, the fifth wave officially, yeah. Right, right. So it's been a real up and down journey in Japan not so different from elsewhere in the world. Um, uh, the, the case numbers are, are obviously different because every country counts them differently. And I've been watching it from here in the States. So that's been a really interesting thing to have my eye on Japan while I'm here in the States and watch this whole thing unfold. Um, again, you're, there is a downloadable PDF so you can take your time going through this timeline uh, and feel free to use the slides with credit as well. Um, I'd like to just go over a little bit about the perceptions around the pandemic among Japanese people. I mentioned that uh, more people disapprove uh, of the government's handling of it than approve. And that's a very interesting thing in Japan to have Japanese people actually check a negative box on a, on a research survey. Um, they tend to be uh, a little more forgiving than we are in other countries. Um, but, but certainly having Japanese people, and this was a national sample, a thousand people across Japan, um, more disapprove of the government than approve is, is a pretty, uh, pretty damning uh, result. Uh, we have 46% intending to be vaccinated. Catherine, I think they're already at that number by now, right? It sounds yes, I like think that's about that. right. Yeah. yeah, in terms of people who want to be vaccinated, correct. Still Excellent. a little hesitancy, but I think you're right there, Debbie. Right, right. And and as of late March, we had at least another 46% who were undecided. So hopefully that's turning a little bit more positive over time. Um, we have half the people thinking that this crisis will not be solved by the end of 2021, um, probably not a big surprise to anyone in the audience. Um, and a third remain uncertain, um, probably a little mixture there of hope and, and, and despair. But uh, half, everyone pretty much expects this is gonna continue on. And here, this was a measurement back in mid-March that a little over half believed the Tokyo Olympics should be canceled. And of course, it, it has not been canceled. Um, that was a higher measurement compared to 2020, actually. So you can see how Japanese public opinion is quite divided on the Olympics. And then when we look at life and work amidst the pandemic, 
we, we can see that many people would, would like working styles to return to normal. I'm gonna show you a few details in a minute about the work environment. 74% um, uh, feel the pandemic has had an impact on their business life today. Um, again, that's not surprising. Um, that was very high in 2020 and it's still high in 2021. And I think one of the most interesting, um, interesting statistics is how people feel less mentally healthy now than before um, the pandemic. So a third of, of the people saying that is, is actually quite large for Japan. Um, Japanese people are very stoic and they tend not to uh, whinge and moan the way we do in the States. I can say that I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't hear as much, I never ever heard people complaining in Japan the way that they do in the States. So uh, I think to have 34% say they feel less mentally healthy now is actually really high impact. Uh, people also feel they're not getting uh, as, as much physical uh, exercise as they would like and, um, and they're more conscious of their physical health now. So that's good. Uh, they one third feel they have lost social connection, probably not surprising. And another third feel that the digital spaces kept them from feeling lonely. And one of the interesting things we've seen during the pandemic is the devastating effect of loneliness and isolation on older Japanese citizens. Um, that has become really, really um, evident, but it actually spans all age groups. Looking at the working environment, you can see here, you, you know, it's basically business as usual is not so different from one year to the next. Uh, Japanese businesses really kept on pushing quite a lot compared to companies in the rest of the world. But what's really interesting here is what I've highlighted in gray, and that is that some staff are working remotely via teleworking. That is new. We've got a change last year during the height of the beginning of the pandemic of 17% all the way to 29% now. That means it is sticking. That trend is sticking. And I think that's a really interesting, uh, interesting point. Um, another point that's very interesting about the um, working habits in Japan is that I think many, many of us from the West have always hoped that digitalization would help change Japan's rigid working environment. But actually what we're finding as far as what consumers think is that flexibility and such as the working from home style is what has really uh, made those changes real. So um, I think that we, we do have a pretty open in, environment in Japan towards tech and digitalization, but flexibility in the workplace in terms of being at the office or not is actually making quite quite a bigger impact from the consumer viewpoint than digitalization per se. And then um, the, now we're going to move into male and female relationships, which is always really interesting in Japan. Um, this is a ranking of a statement. I think the relations between the sexes have been improved by working from home. And what we're seeing is that both males and females are pretty much agreed on this point um, with a quarter of them saying um, that it has improved. We, we do have some naysayers there, of course, but a quarter is pretty good. Um, the best chart that I like though, is this one that says the statement, men are helping more in the home and paying more attention to their families since the COVID crisis hit. And men think they're being really helpful, but fewer women, women think they're be being helpful. So I think this statistic would actually bear out anywhere in the world, but, uh, and I'm, I'm prejudiced myself, but I just, I just get a big giggle when I see that chart every time. And then when we look at women's progress in society, and I know Kathy's gonna mention this as well because she's really the expert on this area. But what we see from the research is that men and women are starting to, uh, to perceive that um, women's progress is going fairly well in Japan. And we have, um, we have lower numbers in 2019 among males and females, but we're seeing that both of them are pretty equal 
when we get into this year. So uh, I think there have been some real changes happening during the pandemic that have been perhaps more organic than we might even know uh, or can see at this point in time. We also have a pretty high agreement, 39% among males and 38% among females for the idea that employers are becoming more socially progressive in their attitudes towards women and diversity. So that's good. Um, that there is definite movement there. Uh, Japan is always very slow on this. And, and again, Kathy, please jump in there because I, I think you're the poster child for patience <laughs> since you started in the, in the late 90s promoting this womenomics. But, uh, but I, I do think it looks like there's been, been some progress made. Just looking at consumer spending, um, we've seen some uh, really interesting uptake in digital payment options, um, increasing payments with contactless, um, and, and a lot of good, um, I think, penetration into areas of, let's say, consumer segments who maybe hadn't done it before. So that's been, that's been a good thing. Um, the current spending mood is pretty strong with things that won't surprise you, streaming services, home delivery services, online shopping, healthier foods and beverages, and items for improving the home environment. In fact, those, those areas have all been doing really, really well. Um, when we look at the overall mood though, a conservative uh, spending mood prevails and people actually are saying that they'll be pretty conservative even, even without COVID. And I think it's been quite quite a, a long-term, prolonged, scary situation. And not knowing what the future holds does have a way of changing the way that you think about buying things and spending your money. When we look at losers in the in the area of of consumer spending, of course, dining out and theme parks were very hard hit. Uh, during the pandemic and, and still continue to only be making a very slow and cautious recovery. Um, and of course, uh, things like jewelry and luxury goods are still struggling. So, you know, again, some winners, some losers, um, a cautious spending behavior endures with the pandemic. And, you know, I think uh, it, it really means that cons uh, companies need to stay in touch with their consumers and touch base again and reconnect and find out where their, uh, where their thoughts and needs are these days because we really have, you know, I think what they say in, is that it takes about three weeks to change a habit. I, I, could, I, could, I could refute that statistic, but, but let's say it takes three weeks to embed a good new habit. We've been in this pandemic for well over a year. And so imagine what that has done to everyone's ways of being and ways of doing. So it's just a really, really interesting time in the consumer markets. That is all I have in terms of slides. Again, you can download that uh, from, your, uh, from, from Global Chamber after the fact. And, um, and we're always happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Outstanding, great foundational information from, from both of you. Just a quick question, Debbie. How long has the Carter Group been doing that annual survey? We've been doing that for five years, Doug. Thanks for asking. And that is the fifth, the fifth annual tracker. Okay. So fifth, fifth measurement. So what's really interesting is when you look at that over five years and the last two years were COVID, um, it's, it's actually pretty, pretty interesting. I, I bet it is. Um, thank you for sharing. Uh, Kathy, we're gonna now turn to you to uh, shift a little bit and be a little bit more specific now uh, in work from home. When uh, the ladies um, last year, about a year or so ago, talked about the Japan situation, it was early in the pandemic, and we talked about work from home almost as if this would be uh, an impossibility uh, within the Japanese market. And now here we are a year later. Uh, what's your view, uh, particularly with large companies in Japan? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Um, and first of all, thanks to the Global Chamber for inviting me. 
uh, and to Debbie, of course, and Catherine uh, for organizing this uh, session. So I think to answer your question, how larger companies reacted initially was um, staring in the headlamps of an oncoming vehicle, I think is the right <laughs> characterization, i.e. it was a very abrupt shock to their system. Uh, many companies, frankly, uh, did not have many staff uh, members actually doing remote work. So the infrastructure was not set up. They didn't have the equipment or they didn't have the networking uh, installed. So that was a pretty um, just sudden you know, need to shift. But just from my vantage point, I think that there were definitely you know, some silver linings, um, some that have already been mentioned, but one is that if you think about how um, many large Japanese companies tend to evaluate their staff, it tends to be more on what I call a FaceTime or seniority basis as opposed to actual performance and output, which means that if you're not physically together, or at least you're not visibly seeing you know, how long is Sato-san at the office um, every day, it becomes very difficult. And so what I think the pandemic did, which from my perspective was actually helpful, was really force a lot of organizations to rethink, reassess that performance evaluation process, the metrics uh, and shift, force them to shift a little bit away from the time metric uh, to the output metric, number one. Number two, I think it also enabled uh, not just women, but everybody in Japan to work more flexibly. Uh, there is not one company, large company in this uh, nation that does not have you know, telework or work from home as an option on the HR website but very, very few people voluntarily opt for that um, choice, largely because of what I just explained. And so you go from that to a situation where it becomes, we say in Japanese, atarimae, so not a great translation, but it, it is the only mode of, of work uh, that becomes available is working from home. I think, and, and in the beginning, of course, people were very nervous, oh, you know, we can't track people's, you know, how, how much they're working. Maybe they're just sitting at a cafe all day and just checking in on their mobile phones. That's not really work. But we've seen output and productivity. Of course, there are uh, exceptions, but lar largely speaking, I think most corporations here have been pleasantly surprised at to the extent to which uh, work has been able to be accomplished, uh, even in a, a remote fashion. So to me, that's you know, silver lining is it can actually work. Uh, we had to test it through a pandemic. It was a very sudden test, but I think now companies are realizing, hmm, maybe we don't need everybody in the office working such long hours. Remember the background or context of this is coincidentally, the Japanese government just recently instituted legal limits on working hours. When I was at Goldman, we were having to uh, check spreadsheets every month if any of our junior staff were working uh, beyond what, what the government required as kind of dangerously long hours. Uh, we had to check in with them, uh, ask them why they're working long hours and things like that. So it's a very interesting kind of confluence of factors that is really, I think, forcing companies, managements to rethink well, wait a minute, maybe there is um, indeed a different way of working that can actually not just maintain productivity and output, but actually might you know, lift it uh, over time. So um, that's what I'd say on, on this topic. Yeah. Because of that, are you sensing that this might have a positive impact on women's opportunities in the workplace? Absolutely. And of course, uh, I, I would be remiss if I did not mention that exactly like the rest of the world, the, the, the segment of the population that is born the brunt of COVID has been women and um, definitely here as well. They tend to be um, overrepresented in the industries that were hit the hardest, particularly in services. Um, and so, you know, just want to recognize, go on record for saying that it's definitely been very, very, um, you know,
know, devastating uh, for a large segment of the female population in this country, job losses, uh, particularly in those sectors included. Having said that though, what I just mentioned about the, now it, it's no longer, you know, hypothetical, uh, this working from home and telework, but it's actually become real and not just women, but men are um, doing work from home and working in a more flexible manner. I don't see how this cannot be you know, a positive long-term for everybody in Japan society, yeah. who we all know, um, you know, Japan is not at the top of the global productivity rankings. And I think that if this can boost uh, digitalization, um, boost uh, work uh, flexibility, boost uh, inside homes, uh, empathy um, by the other partner um, about um, you know, what actually has to be dealt with in the home and with children if, if they exist. All, all of these things, I think, in, in my perspective, over time will prove, I think, uh, quite positive for society, yeah. Uh, interesting that something so terrible would would have such and sorry, a silver well, well, one more thing. Sorry, while I'm on this topic that I want to mention because it dovetails to what Debbie was saying about attitudinal shifts. So what I've observed um, when I was at Goldman, I retired at the end of last year, but 70% of Goldman Sachs' employees globally are millennials or Gen Z. So essentially these could be my children, right? And what has been striking to me as somebody who's been focused on this diversity topic for decades is the very uh, visible, uh, palpable shift in the attitudes and values of young Japanese men. It used to be the case that the only colleagues who would ask me about work-life balance issues, right? Oh, Matsu-san, you have two children. How did you manage family and work, right? I never got that question from men male colleagues. But in the last few years before I retired, so I would say in the last five, six or so years, a distinct shift uh, started to occur where young men were asking me these sorts of questions. And I thought this is really strange. So I asked my colleagues in London, in New York, in Hong Kong, are you observing anything similar or is it just Japan? And they all nodded their heads and they said, nope, it's universal. And how, how you know, exciting is that insofar as if you think, you know, to move this mountain of Japan, uh, particularly on this subject when it comes to diversity and work-life flexibility, it seems to have been kind of a battle of the minority, but it becomes the battle of the majority. Wow, you know, Japan takes forever to decide to change, but <laughs> once it decides, like, you know, look out is what we often say. So that's what, um, is to me very exciting is that younger generation uh, is really driving that change because they, they don't want to work as their fathers and grandfathers did. They want to spend more time with their families. And why is that not a positive thing? It's, that's huge, tremendously um, encouraging in my view. Sorry, I'm just adding that. No, I remember when I joined a firm in, in Tokyo, an old traditional Japanese firm, one of the fellows there was fairly close to retirement and he had stored up 65 weeks of vacation. He had never taken a sick day and he came, you know, he was very proud that through a 30 plus year career, never had, had done that. And so I think it goes to you know, what we know has been the situation and that now it seems like there's an earthquake of change. So thank you for sharing that information. I'm wondering, Catherine, uh, at the SMEs, are, are we seeing similar type of uh, trends as well? Well, amazing statistics there, Kathy. And also, Doug, taking us back to that being a proud moment that someone would have that many weeks they didn't take holiday. I'm just astounded to hear that. And it's it's true, but I'd forgotten quite how that was. But uh, I think things have moved. And I, I really did love that uh, those anecdotes too from Kathy about how the young generation are changing things. For SMEs, I think uh, a global Globinar attendees will remember last time I said that SMEs are the backbone of Japanese society. Um, and the economy. Um, mostly, 
you know, there's around 90%, shall we say, um, 90% of businesses in Japan are those SME uh, sizes. Um, Kathy's talked about the large businesses, but 90%, more than that, it's actually around 96% are small and medium-sized businesses, and they employ 70% of Japanese population or the population in Japan. So were they prepared for the pandemic or not? Some were IT prepared, some were not. Uh, the ones that had IT systems just didn't have this work from home culture. And, and uh, Kathy's talked a little bit about that. The other group who did have IT were, um, you know, were, well, the ones that didn't have IT didn't have IT culture or the work from home concept. And SMEs found it very hard within their reserves to shell out for, say, laptops for people to take home. Um, there was little budget for the IT. And so there was also a very little uptake in VPNs. Uh, Japanese uh, only took up 1%, 1% of the people took up VPNs compared to say 11% in the US according to the statistics. So last year work from home was really only around 50%. Prime Minister Suga said, we've got to get to 70%. And I witnessed and heard anecdotally about an older male Japanese management uh, person who had to learn Zoom. Actually, one of my very first meetings with people going online was to teach them how to use Zoom. Then the next time we got into um, actually doing the meeting, but they were really um, having a sense of pride. And they were empowered that these older guys could, and they were guys and they were older, who could actually then start using Zoom. It made them feel really good. So we talk about old dog and new tricks. I think they learned a few new tricks. But Japanese still trudging into the office. Alas, that uh, work from home percentage, we do want to get it up higher, but it's still hovering around 20, 22%. Um, you know, I think Japan, uh, in America, it's around 45%. But one uh, salary man who was interviewed by the um, Wall Street Journal said this, and I'll read it, Japanese fossil corporate bosses cannot understand Zoom or other applications and are afraid they will be found out and the culture of presenteeism is there. So they're un unwilling to plug at home and they go into the office. So again, we hope this younger generation will change things, but the older generation is still pretty much there. And just, you know, Japan actually has a historical context of working from home, teleworking from the 1980s. It was just very, it is very hard to break into this. And many of those, um, you know, local uh, government offices never really uh, gave it a model, never really modeled this behavior. And so it's very hard to get them up there now but hopefully again this young generation we're really counting on them one thing i have noticed is that in the uh change to being online these decision making dinners have tended to fall away so a lot of business decisions were made over dinner going out i'm sure you had a few of those doug uh, but now people are doing video conferencing and faster decision making overall and that's what i'm hearing from the smes that i talked to prior to this and also the other thing we have to recognize is manual processes. Japan loves its paper. It loves its paper and its processes. But we're seeing a little bit of a move here, thank you, to the silver lining of the pandemic, um, that people are moving towards digitalization. We are seeing some e-signatures e on contracts a little bit further. And the hunkor, which is the chop or the stamp, some of that is moving to uh, not having the chop and into digitized Pro, uh, you know, processes. So we're seeing a little bit of that. Um, and also, as Kathy mentioned, these dads working from home, lots of dads I've spoken to have told me they've thoroughly enjoyed being at home during um, the pandemic. Um, they never thought that, but they sort of feel sad if they have to return to the new way. So hopefully those guys will also get a sense of confidence and, and challenge the workplace uh, so that they can um, live their values, their new values. And thoughts on returning to work? Well, I think it's really being determined right now. There are lots of different office plans going out there where people are changing the way the office looks, but the office is just a place for people to come and get together for certain activities, like a, t a meeting that has to be held in person, or to get the culture or get people together for a social activity. So sort of flipping it, um, the, the way that the office will be used and those new designs of office buildings will be quite interesting to see. I think I'll break there, Doug, because that's a little bit of a roundup on SMEs, but a little tough still for them, I think, without the resources, but they are moving forward. 
I'll, I'll, I'll let Debbie just say a couple comments about that and either reinforce or, or give certainly give her opinion uh, about that thought. I'm wondering when you were talking, I, I was thinking of the, 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 the classic setup in an office where with the bucho at the end and all of the desks lined up. And once you kind of get into that style, you're hearing all of these things going on. How does that even get partially simulated at, at home? It must feel lonely. There must be something, you know, I mean, I, I would, when I left that, I kind of felt like, boy, it's, it's very sterile without all of that noise around you. Um, so you've got a lot of people, it sounds like, getting adjusted to kind of this new reality. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder Debbie, if you're seeing the same things. Yes, we are right in the thick of the SME space um, as an 80 person company in Tokyo and Osaka. And certainly we were greatly affected by everything to do with the pandemic, not only having people come to the office, but we actually normally would have invited research respondents to come to our offices. Wow. And we would have been, inter our team would have been interacting with uh, Japanese consumers to do the research that we do. And we had to change everything about the way that we did that because we couldn't do face-to-face -face anymore. Um, our team did a fabulous job early on um, pivoting to digital means. So doing all of our focus groups and one-on-ones via Zoom and WebEx and different uh, platforms. Um, I have sat here in Texas literally watching focus groups in Japan and listening to an interpreter through a second platform. So, you know, watching on Zoom, listening through Skype. Anyway, there's all kinds of ways that we can get around things. <laughs> and I think that's one of the one of the beauties of the pandemic is that we kind of had to. Um, I'm real proud of us as a company. Uh, we have been, you know, frustrated like everyone with the the states of emergency and the difficulty in understanding what's a state of emergency and, and not a state of emergency, because it all feels like an emergency at some point. But um, we, we basically have got everyone coming in only when necessary. And uh, obviously the research is almost all digital for, for now. Um, we have a few clients who have ventured back into what we call central location testing, where we bring together audiences to watch movies and look at trailers and things like that. Um, and th that's been you know, done in keeping with the theater uh, social distancing measures. So whatever we have done has been absolutely in keeping with um, you know, pandemic measures and safety measures. Um, obviously we and the clients don't want any problems. So we're very hesitant to, to do those kinds of exercises. So I think for now we're, 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 we're far more focused on doing it digitally and we're really focused on having our people just work from home and only come in when necessary because we can all meet, we can all meet anyway uh, online. Interesting, so the human spirit finds a way. Uh, Kathy, I'd like to now shift to, to your thoughts about the actual economic impact, uh, particularly at the corporate level, you know, hospitality has dramatically changed, right? Restaurants and hotels and travel. I would imagine perhaps as in other countries, automotive usage is um, sales is down. I, I don't know, but there have been some significant changes around the world. Wonder if you're seeing some of those same things in Japan and how that's impacting corporate uh, Japan. Sure. So I, I think Japan's sort of economic um, evolution, so to speak, since the pandemic struck um, follows a fairly similar pattern, albeit like Debbie pointed out, uh, we never had a hard, um, you know, stay at home uh, mandatory requirement. Uh, it was sort of, you know, this understood <laughs> everybody follows the rules, everybody wears a mask. Um, so it was managed a, a bit differently, but I think the shock to the system, so to speak, uh, was perhaps a little bit more muted than we've observed elsewhere. In terms of what you uh, asked about at the corporate level, uh, again, to uh, what Debbie mentioned earlier, 
Uh, I, I think it's pretty obvious some of the industries that have relatively benefited uh, from e-commerce uh, to uh, so telemedicine uh, providers, payments systems, fintech, um, you know, computer related infrastructure demand has gone way up. Uh, but you know the things that you could, can no longer do, which is you know pack restaurants and bars full and go on holiday trips, uh, have been hit you know uh, inordinately very 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 hard. So of course there's been this bifurcation you know within the economy just like uh, everywhere else. But I think you know from um, you know my perspective, while it has been an excuse for many companies as well to say, hey, business is not doing great and we can just blame it on the pandemic. Well, that ability to use that excuse, hopefully, <laughs> won't be with us, say, in a, in a year from now. I'm saying hopefully and touching a lot of wood uh, in my room here. But if that is the case, then I think it will become quite evident which companies were able to proactively invest, say, in digitalization of their processes, um, to help them become more resilient versus those that had their heads in the sand, just use that excuse to not invest, um, not hire you know, the best people or retain the best talent in their organizations and therefore you know, kind of fall further and further behind uh, from the winner's pack. So I think this bifurcation that uh, we've already seen uh, emerge in the economy will only become you know, even greater. I will also say again, even well before the pandemic, in my old uh, job, uh, I was doing a lot of work around corporate governance matters. And as you know, Japanese companies in general, uh, particularly at the larger company level, uh, are frankly awash with cash, which is quite bizarre if you think about it objectively when an economy has a zero cost of capital. Um, and these are publicly traded companies, so uh, presumably they have some you know, degree of responsibility of managing that cash. Uh, but a lot of them have been sitting on the cash. And so uh, about six years ago, uh, Japan's government really started to push uh, corporate governance reforms. And part of that agenda was to put a spotlight on this excess cash on balance sheets. Now, again, with, with, amidst a global pandemic, having cash is king. Uh, many other uh, countries probably were uh, a bit envious of Japan Inc's very, very uh, formidable cash position, which of course have served a lot of these companies very well. Having said that though, the cost of capital hasn't changed since the pandemic struck, it's still zero. And um, very, I think encouragingly, at least from my perspective as Japanese government's really put a lot of pressure on companies, for example, when it comes to governance, you know, um, not so good governance standards such as cross holdings or um, uh, having poison pills uh, in place, how do you explain that? Or having directors on your board that are actually not that independent, et cetera, et cetera. This movement to me, along with, you know, what are you doing with their cash uh, has really been a healthy one. And I think the pandemic, um, you know, frankly, if we, if we had it, if we didn't have it, it didn't really matter, but I think that uh, this movement of better governance, and by the way, as of two days ago, the Tokyo Stock Exchange is revamping entirely the categorization of um, kind of the larger companies down to the smaller companies. In other words, revamping the exchanges. So there are different criteria now you need to meet to stay in the what, is, what has been the first section of the stock exchange. Uh, it was frankly a very loose set of criteria. Pretty much everybody could join that exclusive club. It wasn't so exclusive, but everybody could join. And now the membership criteria has become much more stringent, which means, for example, liquidity uh, requirements. If you don't have enough free float, if your stock, uh, if your company profile, you need to sell some of the stable shareholdings or cross holdings. Um, so a lot of these things to me are very, have been very healthy movements in the right direction. And I think the pandemic has simply put a greater microscope of focus uh, on what our company is doing with their balance sheets, with their capital efficiency. Um, and I would also add, you know, one of the reasons I'm doing what I'm doing now, which is an ESG focused VC fund is because uh, we believe that th th these trends are secular, not just cyclical uh, in terms of um, trying to improve Japanese overall corporate governance. Interesting. So impacting governance and also 
uh, noting that there's still cash there in the system is very much of a positive thing. Wonder, Catherine, what are you seeing on the SME side and what are some of the differences uh, or, or, or is it really mirror the same thing? Well, you, I mean, Kathy's pointed to the, the cash laden uh, corporates, but on the other side of things, the SMEs were really really struggling and their concern was cash flow typically they only had about 30 to 60 days I think and you know they had worries about their income and sales and health and safety of employees and and how their supply chains were going to survive and the Japanese government did dish out a few uh, measures to support SMEs but I know a dozen SMEs who personally just tried to apply for these loans uh, and subsidy packages and they were just ridden again with a uh, complex way of filling out the forms and I'm talking about forms somewhere on digital um, just very very difficult time consuming very hard to get the actual needs that they needed but if you were to ask me about terms of trends that I'm seeing uh, Doug I would like to give a couple of very quick examples because um, I think it's really important that you hear a lot more from Kathy about her new business because that's a bright horizon for Japan, and we've really got to hear that today. But Japanese traditional businesses have been pivoting. If you think about um, the shrines and temples in Japan, there's 100,000 shrines, 80,000 temples, and revenue was really, really high, about 530 billion in 2019. But in 2021, it's predicted to deep dip down into about 200 billion. They rely on donations and people actually visiting shrines and, and, and um, temples. But Buddhist monks of all people who are probably SMEs, I would say, they pivoted and they did online live streaming of uh, religious ceremonies and funerals and online meditations. And you could hire someone to go off to your grave site, your family grave site and lay the flowers and do prayers for you. And you could watch that online. So that's one big change in Japan. The other is a great story that just came out this month of a Tokyo mother who invented a COVID-19 jab database, um, helping non-Japanese speakers here be able to find out where they could get the COVID-19 vaccine. She saw a need. There were no news in any other language that she found. So she did a coding course. This is a mother raising a baby. She did the coding course, and hours later, she'd launched this database called Find a Doc. Uh, I've been on there and had a look at it. It's incredible. So that helps um, Japanese clinics who have got an overflow, um, people who don't come in for the vaccine, they can go in there, find a doctor, find a place that's serving the vaccine, and go and get it. Um, and I just saw a comment in, or a question in the uh, chat if we're talking about vaccines. Japan has the Pfizer vaccine and Moderna. They also have AstraZeneca on hold and are donating that to other countries. But the, the vaccine that's being used right now for everybody here, foreigners and Japanese, are, are those two, Pfizer and Moderna. So I'll hand it back then to Doug, but I'd really love you to get to Kathy and, and talk about this amazing project she's working on. Absolutely. I'd like to hear about it as well. Kathy, um, you've just started Japan's first venture fund that's focused in on ESG, which is environmental social governance. It's a trend globally. And to hear that it's taking root in Japan as well is very exciting. Could you tell us a little bit more about how that is going in Japan and perhaps some of the opportunities we should be aware of? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for giving uh, me the opportunity to share. Uh, so I have two partners, uh, Yumiko Murakami and Miwa Seki. We have uh, been colleagues. Uh, Miwa was one of my clients. She was a Japanese equities portfolio manager. And we happen to be the so same uh, birth month and birth year. So we've been friends forever, but we also share a commonality, which is uh, each of our parents uh, are entrepreneurs. And all of us have actually worked in larger you know, organizations all our lives and just felt some bug of, <laughs> you know, what if, um, you know, kind of tugging at us. And so about two years ago, we began discussing this idea. And in the beginning, it was more just a straightforward VC, you know, fun because Japan's VC market, meaning uh, the amount of investment uh, relative to the size of its economy is only 1 35th that of the US and 1 18th that of China. Despite being the third largest economy in the planet, it punches well below its weight, in other words, in 
the venture space in venture investing. And we thought, why is this? <laughs> and if Japan needs uh, growth, uh, needs innovation to drive that growth, um, of course, large companies can spawn innovative businesses, but we think that most of the companies that have become very successful and very innovative in Japan's ecosystem have come out from a startup you know, sort of background. So we thought VC was the space for us, but then we thought, well, wait a minute, you know, while we don't have direct venture investing experience ourselves, what we do have is a wealth of experience and knowledge when it comes to ESG related matters. I've mentioned earlier about corporate governance because it's Japan's market that I've covered for three decades, um, gender diversity with my womanomics research. And we felt, wait a minute, maybe if we focused on <clears throat> you know, companies in the kind of mid to late growth stage, i.e. before they go public, wouldn't it be easier to um, you know, like I, I don't know if you use these words appropriately, but convert them to the you know religion of good governance, of uh, being mindful of their environmental impact, <clears throat> how they think about the impact of their supply chains, how they treat the well-being of their employees, etc. Aren't these values and principles better to instill in these companies when they're teenagers before they become full? flung adults in the public market, which of course they open themselves up to enormous scrutiny uh, on these matters. And at the same time, Japan has not, um, has been a bit late to the ESG investment, um, you know, uh, story uh, following Europe and then the United States. But I believe it is one of the fastest growing markets for ENG and ESG investing in the world today. And so as we speak with companies that are in that growth to later stage of development, they're eyeing say an IPO within the next two to four years. We are positively surprised at how high the level of consciousness is by these young entrepreneurs that they have to get this ESG thing right. And it's not just about box ticking, which is very easy for many companies to do. And of course, now the regulators are very uh, cautiously you know, sending out uh, warning signals about greenwashing, which I know is a concern for the SEC and regulators elsewhere. Uh, so similar to that uh, is happening here in Japan. And they want to really uh, genuinely fix uh, the parts of ESG that they believe uh, they're weak. And with our backgrounds, with our um, expertise and knowledge, we wanna partner with those companies uh, to help them along their ESG journeys so that they become what we call ESG natives before again, uh, they go public. And that's um, sort of our mission. It, it's not perhaps a model that will fit every startup company. We, we absolutely know that, but we think in the value chain of venture investing, we are filling a gap that currently exists. Um, and we are the first, but we definitely hope we're not the last. We hope that there are many, many other investors who will follow us. Uh, we're very fortunate to have raised uh, capital from very large Japanese financial institutions and corporates who are very aligned with this mission of integrating ESG and in startups. So um, we're hope, you know, we're, we're ambitious. We want to create a movement, uh, not just in Japan but globally, um, in, in terms of ESG uh, integration with startups. Fantastic! Congratulations. If it all works out as you imagine. What, what does the future hold? What are you, what does success look like? And then also uh, very interested to know how people who are watching, either if they're running a company or they, they're an investor, how would they get involved? So I think what we're trying to prove is this hypothesis that ESG integration can enhance performance, can enhance value over time. I think not, that long ago, there was this perception held pretty widely globally that sustainability or ESG investing equaled lower returns, lower performance. Um, and even prior to the pandemic, if you looked at the performance, average performance of, this is the US market uh, where the most data uh, exists on ESG slash sustainability linked funds, 
relative to the rest of uh, the market, those funds tended to be in the top half of performance and a very large chunk were in the top quartile. But it has not yet been proven in the private investing space or VC. And we want to prove that um, it also applies uh, in the venture capital arena. So of course, we're aiming for superior financial returns just like any other VC, uh, but we also want to prove that our integration of ESG and our partnering with the companies um, in a strategic way, not just box ticking, but this is core to their business strategies, that that can translate uh, into overall uh, better performance and returns. Um, as to your second question, you know, please help us with this movement, uh, wherever you uh, are. Um, yes, there are a lot of naysayers. And I, like I said, there is a lot of uh, greenwashing occurring. So we have to be very, very mindful of what is real and what is not. Uh, and there's no global standards yet. There's, you know, SASB is, is trying to work towards uh, a global standard. But again, that's mainly uh, targeting larger uh, publicly traded companies. Uh, we want to help create a global standard uh, uh, for private uh, companies. Uh, you know, UNPRI and, and those uh, organizations are also trying to move in that direction. It's still early days and we know we're early, but um, we, we can definitely see the writing on the wall. So a simple example, you know, NASDAQ is proposing that uh, companies who want to go public on NASDAQ must have not one, but two diverse board members to qualify for listing. That's like revolutionary, right? My uh, old employer, Goldman Sachs, David Solomon, the CEO, over a year ago at Davos announced that Goldman would not help underwrite any company's IPO if they didn't have at least one diverse board member. You can imagine and you're like, what? You know, we're giving up you know, market share to our competition. But the rationale is very simple. It's not because it's just the right thing to do. It's because it's, you know, it makes business and economic sense for us. Um, the more diverse think, thinking and cognitive diversity you have on a board, the better those performance, the performance of those entities has tended to be over time. So I think this is not just a fad or a flavor of the month or the year, but it's, um, I think, grounded in empirical evidence. And there's a ton of that evidence coming out now, um, but we'd like to create more evidence uh, in the private space, again, before they become uh, bigger companies or public. There has been evidence to, to that uh, effect in other countries. And so are you saying there's also evidence within Japan or is part of what you're working through to, to kind of pr to prove it that it also is, is the case in Japan as well? Yeah, there's a lot of evidence globally in the public equity markets, right? And you know, Goldman, we, we're doing a lot of research in that arena, but much less uh, information data available at the private company level, right? Um, there are a handful of VC oriented, uh, sorry, ESG oriented VC funds in Europe that we've been in contact with. Uh, very few that we've been able to identify in the States, but I think that's coming. Um, and a handful in, in Asia that we've been speaking with as well. So it's, it's a burgeoning movement. Um, it's gaining traction. Um, and again, because the world is just such a different place, I mean, a lot of companies are deciding to stay private a lot longer or not going public at all. Um, or you know, there are more avenues uh, to growth than what we kind of grew up with 20, 30 years ago. So um, yeah, that, that's where I think it is top of mind uh, for every asset owner, uh, large, you know, pensions and endowments. It's top of mind for every asset manager that's trying to get the mandates <laughs> for uh, investment for those asset owners. Uh, so this is not going away. Uh, and so we're just starting at the kind of beginning of that food chain and trying to work with entrepreneurs uh, and making sure that they instill these values uh, in their companies early on. Fantastic. Thank, thank you, Kathy. I'd like now, because we're at the end of the hour, to, to go to each of the three of you, uh, perhaps Debbie, you first, and just kind of any anything else that uh, you'd like to comment on, any uh, final conclusions or, or anything else that you'd like to close with before we uh, close the session? Uh, Debbie first. Thank you, Doug. Um, gosh, I, I learned so much myself this time. It was great. And um, I just, I, I think what strikes me is that this is a story that is still unfolding. 
in in so many ways and um you know we should all just stay tuned and uh, we'll come back and do an update whenever you're ready, Doug. <laughs> you know, might want to give it a few months, uh, see what happens with the Olympics and everything. But um, very excited to personally get through the Olympics and get on with it. That's that's my my personal and business uh, thought at this point. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Catherine. How about you? Any other comments or? concluding remarks that you'd like to make? I've, I've just been astounded at the, uh, you know, information that Kathy's given, and I just look so much forward to the brighter future of uh, private and public uh, entities here as they take on this new challenge. I think also, if I might quote someone very close to the heart of Kathy, Jasper Cole, um, he has recently said that Japan stands on the dawn of a new golden age for entrepreneurs. One of the flip sides of this pandemic with the people who have lost their jobs is actually human capital has been opened up and there's a real uh, need for human capital within entrepreneur, entrepreneurial businesses and they haven't been able to get it. But the flip side is now that there is this human capital. And so Jasper, if you see him and check him out uh, in his business wisdom tree, you'll see this uh, writing that he's doing on this area. And I really love this because it's really showing that there is a golden chance now for entrepreneurs. And if they take on some of what Kathy's talking about, I think they're going to be uh, excelling and we're going to see a different kind of Japan. Like, like Debbie, I want to get through the Olympics here. I'll be positive about them throughout uh, and hope that we go further forward. And we would love to come back and do another update uh, at a later time. Thank you, Doug, for this opportunity. Our pleasure. Have, have you noticed a Richard Branson-like entrepreneur in Japan yet who's charging people to go into space? Or is that his name still is, His early? name is uh, Maezawa-san. Maezawa, uh, Something yes. called Zozo. And yes, he, he, he's the one that bought the... Um, I don't know, most expensive jet. Uh, painting and yeah yeah and uh, he just anyway, bought a jet he just brought a private jet that's decked out in Hermes everywhere so um yeah but he's he, the but one he, isn't yeah. he Kathy he's also yeah trying to um, recruit fellow uh citizens to go up in space with him he doesn't have his own rocket ship or whatever missile <laughs> but uh, um not yet I guess he would be close closest to that but I think you know my, my, if I may, last parting words uh, to this group is uh, Japan may not be on everybody's radar screens, but that's exactly why it should on yours. And I think that all of us who have been, you know, slogging away at Japan for decades, um, it has been frustrating to see how slow things move. But uh, to Catherine's point, you know, human capital is definitely now flowing into these higher growth uh, areas of the economy. Um, I saw this at Goldman, you know, pe young people were not staying as long as they typically were staying, but were leaving um, much earlier, usually for a huge cut in pay, but they felt that life was short and they wanted to take a risk while they could. And this is super, super important. Um, to have that human talent flow uh, into the entrepreneurial space. And secondly, and finally, is the government uh, is also trying to push this digital agenda forward, um, also the green agenda forward, it's like digitalization and green. But in particular, they're planning to launch very soon in the next, I think, few months, a new digital agency, which we frankly don't know exactly what this is going to do, but one of the purposes seems to be to break down the silos um, uh, between you know, government, academia, private sector, because Japan has a lot of uh, very um, cutting edge IP and technologies that maybe are housed in the recesses of university research institutes and labs. They have a very hard time commercializing or bringing you know, those ideas and products to market. Um, and of course, the whole analog nature of everything, <laughs> a lot of processes and in the government uh, that is done, they want to, to, to eliminate that as well. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is there is this top-down kind of macro-driven push also uh, to make uh, Japan more product productive, more efficient. So I think these two um, forces at work with talent uh, as well as the policy uh, will hopefully make Japan 
uh, relevant enough for many of you uh, to really start digging deeper uh, at the opportunities in this market. Until now, it's honestly, to me, felt a little bit like lip service from the government, and maybe it's, it was just the glacial change that, mm -hmm. that, that was required. And so has the pandemic then really created um, an, an opportunity for a faster change? It sounds like that's the case. We hope so. Hope so, too. I'm, I'm, I always think about um, Kyoko Toyama, who was one of the first Global Chamber members and a picture in her office. She worked for a company based out of Nagoya, but she uh, started as an assistant in the United States in Wisconsin. And she then became part of a team that selected the headquarters for this Nagoya based company in the US. And ultimately over 20 years, she became the president of the, the North American operation. And whenever she went to Japan to be with the other board members, 22 men and Kyoko, and I, I, I live with that picture in my brain every day when I think about Japan and how we, things uh, used to be, um, largely still are, but now more optimistic that in fact, things are changing and not just for change sake, but Kathy, what you talked about is that we know from other countries and other companies experience that diversity, diversity of thought and ESG can add value to the bottom line for companies. And it's very encouraging to hear from all of you uh, that there are some uh, silver linings in, in, in all of this. So uh, Kathy Matsui, thank you so much, Catherine O'Connell and Debbie Howard. You're all amazing women. We really appreciate your thoughts today and thank you for coming together for an hour and sharing and definitely would love to have this conversation uh, ideally with me in Japan, you know, opening up a few chapters of Global Chamber, uh, ideally with women leading them. Um, and so let's work on that in the, in the going forward. And in the meantime, we'll be uh, watching all of you make continued progress and your ongoing success. Thank you again for sharing. Uh, I'll, I'll say in final uh, comments, uh, if you're new to Global Chamber, go to globalchamber.org. You'll notice that uh, probably fairly quickly, probably within at least a week or two, this will be a blog post and there'll be a YouTube recording of this. And so you'll be able to access the information again. Also, as Debbie mentioned, we have her presentation and her data and highly recommend that you go to that blog post or send an email to info at globalchamber.org and we'll be happy to share. Thanks again, ladies, for taking this time in the morning. And for those of you who are viewing this from around the world, thank you. Thank you for listening and let's keep making progress. Take care, everybody.